Well, today I'm back from holidays. I'm fired up. I'm ready to go. And um, we had a great time on vacation. And, um, and so before I left, I started a mini-series called Can You Hear Me Now? And, uh, and the inspiration for that came for that when I was sitting in my office trying to talk on my cell phone. And have you ever been in that position where you get your phone and the person says, I can't hear you. Well, and you go, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? You know, and so you do everything you can. And uh, sometimes that's the way it is uh, with our relationship with the Lord. We're wondering, Lord, can you hear me now? Can you hear where I'm at and what's going on in my life? And uh, so, so today, um, this two-part series, which is uh, turned into three parts, and if, we, if I don't go quickly, it'll be four parts, and, uh, but, um, but I've decided I don't want to hurry through this. I want to share with you a message today, <clears throat> and you can turn to your notes uh, if, you down, if you download them that I sent to you, or if they're on the online platform, your, the notes are there under the notes tab, you can take a look at that. But I want to share with you a message about how to recognize God's voice. And that's something we need to be very sensitive to. Because the message that I've been trying to get across in this mini-series is that God still speaks to His people. God still has something to say to your family. He has something to say about your struggles. has something to say about addictions. And has something to say about all the different things that may be happening in our lives. But the question is, is... Are you tuned in to what God wants to say to you? And so as we share this service today, I want us to conclude this series by looking at how to recognize God's voice. And it's so important. See, all around us, there are sounds that are going on, apart from the babies and all that. But there's other sounds going on. There are sound waves that are passing through this building all the time. Don't worry, they're not infected with COVID. They're just sound waves, all right? There's FM radio sound waves, there's AM radio sound waves, there's television, there's your cell phone, and you might hear one go off during the service, so you'll know it's here. Uh, there are internet waves, there's all kinds of sound things going through uh, around us and through us, and unless you're tuned into them, you would never hear them. Unless you're tuned in on your FM radio, you would never pick up on the, on the sound waves that, that are there. And so the same is true with God. God is trying to speak to us. God is trying to encourage us and lift us up. And God is constantly transmitting to us, and I love that. And unless you're tuned in, you're not going to hear him. And if you happen to tune into the wrong channel, which is a part of my message today, you may think it's God, but it's not. Satan also is trying to deliver his message and transmit his message. And sometimes we're pretty good at talking to ourselves, and, and sometimes we can falsely tell ourselves some things that really aren't true, but still we're talking to ourselves. And so we need to be careful that we don't connect to the wrong channel. We need to be careful that we hear the voice of God in this day and age. So how do you know when something's coming into your mind, an idea or an impression, how do you know whether it's from God or whether it's from Satan or whether you just had bad pizza the night before? How do you know when an idea is from Satan? How do you know when it's, when it's yourself? A lot of us like to talk to ourselves. Matter of fact, I tell people I talk to myself all the time because I need somebody intelligent to talk to. <laughs> just joking, all right. But if you confuse your, your desires with what, God is actually wanting to say to us, the results can be very harmful and sometimes even fatal. The Bible tells us, it says, what you think is the right road may lead to death. And that's true. It's very important to know when God is talking to you and when you're just talking to yourself. Isn't that true? In the church today, there are a lot of people saying, God told me to do this. And I'm kind of scratching my head and going, okay. It doesn't fit in, but let's see where this goes. And sometimes God gets blamed for a lot of things that God didn't do. And so we need to make sure that as we learn to hear the voice of God, that we learn to recognize whether that voice is actually God's voice or somebody else. And as I said, a lot of things today God gets blamed for that really isn't his fault at all. And there are people, maybe you even know in your own life, where someone came to you and said, God told me to do this. And you're saying, 
Oh, man, that doesn't make sense. Matter of fact, I read the story in the news about a woman down in Texas who really tragically killed her two little children. And when they had her in court and they said, why would you do such a thing? She said, God told me to do it. And see, obviously all around us there are people who are listening to voices, but they're not God's voice. God would never ask her to do something as insane as that. And so this morning I think it's important for us to recognize God's voice. God is speaking. And so the first part of my message was, are you tuned into it? Or is the noise of this world crowding it out where you think, you know what, just being a Christian is all about going to church and that's it, I did my thing. But you know what, God wants to have a relationship with each of us. He wants to speak into your life and into my life. And to do that, we have to be tuned into his voice. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Don't believe everything you hear just because somebody says it's a message from God. And notice these words, test it first to see if it really is. And I love that. If you're the kind of person like me and you like to circle in your Bible, I would just circle the words, test it. Test it first. And we need to do that. So this morning in my message, I want to give you seven filters or seven tests that you need to, to really walk through if you're going to truly say this is from God or it isn't from God. Now, it's seven, and I've been in your seat before, and you go, seven, oh man, we're never going to get through this. Oh man, a seven. And um, don't worry, if I get fired up, it'll be part four, all right? So... <laughs> I think this is so imperative for the church today here in the 21st century. I think this is so crucial, not only to recognize God still speaks, but how to recognize His voice. I think this is so imperative that I don't know if we should rush through this. So let me give you these seven things, and I want you to kind of take notes if you can, because this is really very important. So when do you know God is talking to you? Here are seven things you need to look at. Number one. You need to ask yourself, does it agree with the Bible? So right, the first thing right out of the gate, the first test of an idea or an impression is you need to ask yourselves, does it agree with what the Bible teaches? Because God will never contradict what is already said in His Word. The Bible is God's Word. It's been given to us over thousands of years, and God will never tell you to <coughs> violate a principle that is in his word because God or the God that we serve is consistent. He's not, he's not wishy-washy. He's not flippant. He is consistent. So he will never tell you to ignore what he's already said. He will never tell you to deny what he's already said. He will never tell you to contradict what he's already said. And so the first filter or the first test on whether the idea we have is from God or not is does it agree with the scriptures? Is it what the Bible says? The Bible says in in Luke chapter 21, it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Proverbs 12, verse 19 says, Truth stands the test of time. What does that mean? It means this. It means if it's true, it will always, it's always been true, it always will be true, and it is true now today. It was true 2,000 years ago. It'll be, it was true 4,000 years ago. It's true 1,000 years ago. It's true 50 years ago. And it's true today. God's word will stand the test of time. And for us as modern day believers, one thing we must never dilute is our commitment to the word of God. To the word of God. So the first filter you need to look at is Does it fit in with what the Bible says? Number two, does it make me more like Christ? If you feel God's asking you to do something, and when you begin to do it, does it make you more like Jesus? Does it make you more like His character? Is the fruit of the Spirit more evident in your life because you follow it and do it? Wow, I've had people say things to me that I thought, man, oh man, if you do that, It's going to lead you away from Jesus. It's not going to lead you closer to him. So does it make you more like Christ? So does that idea or that impression you have, if you follow through on it, if you do it, will it make you more like Christ? Because Jesus is the standard, and I want you to hear me when I say this this morning, Jesus is the standard by which you measure all ideas. 
Jesus is a standard by which you measure all impressions that may come into your mind. God's ultimate goal for your life is to make you like Jesus. To be like him. To walk in his steps. That's, that's the number one goal he has in our lives. Philippians 2.5 says, In your lives you must think and act like Christ Jesus. If that's God's goal for our lives today, it's obvious that he would not put an idea, he would not ask you to do something that would take you in the opposite direction of becoming more like him. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we, must, we take every thought captive, and notice this, so that it is obedient to who? Obedient to the pastor? No. Obedient to your spouse because she says she wants you to do it? No. We take every thought and we make those thoughts obedient to what Christ wants, to Christ. So the impression we get should help us to become obedient and more obedient to Jesus and to walk closer to him and to be more like him in our character. What would Jesus do? Remember those bracelets that were very popular? WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's a great question, still relevant today, especially if you want to know whether you're hearing God's voice or not. Are you with me this morning? Say amen. amen. Okay. And uh, I was going to say, if you're with me, poke the person next to you, but I don't want to cause a fight, so we'll just we'll stay away from that. So number three, the third filter is, does my church family confirm it? Now this is kind of an interesting one. First, so the first filter is, does it agree with the Bible? The second one, does it make me more like Christ? The third thing you should be asking yourself, it does my church family confirm this? You see, we need the wisdom and the counsel and the advice of other godly people in our lives to help us stay on track. Did you know that? I know that many of us kind of say, well, I want to do my own thing. But you know what? One of the things that's most uh, precious and powerful about the church family today is that you were never meant to go through life on your own. You were never meant to be able to, and, this, and here I say this kind of funny, you were never meant to be a lone ranger, even though you look like one this morning, all right? <laughs> With the mask on and everything. God never meant for us to go through life alone. And that's why our church family is so important for us. And the wisdom and the counsel and the advice that saints can give us when it comes to making a decision within our lives is very important for us to, to, to connect to. That's why he created the church family, because we need each other. I want to say that again. We need each other. That's why one of the goals for Spotlight Church uh, as we come through this pandemic is that we want to safely bring people from isolation back into participation because we need each other. And I can remember the first day we opened up the doors and had our first service back in here. You should have seen some of the expressions on people's faces, the countenance that began to glow, and the, just the buzz about people talking and being with one another. It's so encouraging. And as we need each other, we need spiritually mature friends who we can bounce ideas off and that we can get feedback from. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 says this, and this is interesting. God's intent is that, and notice this, is that through the church, not bypassing the church, but through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. I love that verse. It reminds us that through the church and through our interaction as the body of Christ, that God can show his wisdom in ways that we never thought of. And in this, way, in this a day of isolation and individualism, people are saying, you know what, I don't, I don't need the rest of the people. I can do church on my own. And I say, no, 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 you can't. It's through the church and through coming together and interacting with one another through the church that God begins to make his wisdom known. And so we need each other so that we can lean on each other's counsel. So if you're trying to make a decision today, uh, if you're trying to make a decision about something you ought to do, one of the questions you need to ask is, is there somebody spiritually mature around me in the church that I can go to and I can get some feedback from? If God has genuinely spoken to you, if he's genuinely given you an idea or an impression, or if he's asked you to do something, I believe it will be confirmed when you talk to mature believers and they'll say, oh yeah, 
That makes perfect sense. Go, yeah. And so I think that's so important. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9, and, and I got a lot of different scriptures this morning, so I apologize for that. I don't have one page you can turn to and just stay there. I, I, I want you to work your fingers and your brain a little bit and, and just kind of work with me. But in, in Proverbs 11, verse 9, it says, The wisdom of the righteous can save you. N notice that. The wisdom of the righteous. Who are the righteous? It refers back to, in the context, back to the church, the way, the church, and so it, it can save you. It's interesting to me, it doesn't say the wisdom of your best friends. Matter of fact, sometimes you can go to your friends and they'll probably tell you whatever you want to hear. <laughs> you know? But you know what? A good, solid, spiritual saint will say to you what you need to hear, not what you necessarily want to hear. They're going to tell you the truth. And so I believe that one of the filters, one of the tests, is that you need to have... Uh, the feedback of your church family. Number four, is it, a, is it consistent with God, how God has shaped you? And see, before you were even born this morning, before you were, you were even born, I want you to think about this. God planned the contribution that he wanted you to make to this world, and he gave you a shape. He gave you spiritual gifts. He gave you a heart. He gave you abilities. He gave you personality. He gave you... Um, uh, experiences and, and your experiences could be good or bad could be educational experiences that total package God has been at work in your life using all of that even the bad things because he wants you to make a contribution and so the question you need to ask yourself when God begins to speak to you is it is it consistent with how God has shaped me he shaped me and designed me for a very special purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So he's going to impress things on our lives. He's going to ask us to do things that aren't against how we're shaped, but he's going to ask us to do things that fit into that shape. You know, for some of you, the thought of coming up here and playing the keyboard, you're thinking, I would rather, I would rather clean a latrine than play the keyboard. Because some of you, you just, you just don't, that isn't in you, that isn't the way you're shaped. So if God came along and said, I want you to play the keyboard at Spotlight next week, go and talk to the pastor, the pastor's going to say, well, how much keyboard experience do you have? Have you ever done it? No, and I don't really want to do it, but God told me to do it. Well, I'll say, well, let me help you out. You're not going to do it. See, God would never ask you to do something that doesn't fit into your shape with who you are. And so one of the questions and one of the tests you need to ask yourself is that, you know, is it, does it fit into who you are? You know, I like the story about how the, the person came to the pastor and said, you know, the Lord gave me this song. And he said, well, let me listen to it. And he listened to it and he said to the person after, he says, well, you might want to give it back. So... So this morning, I want to encourage you. When you look at the chair that you're sitting on, you can tell by looking at that, at that chair that the purpose of it is for you to sit on it, just by its shape. But if I go over here to Sherry's fiddle, is that what you call it? Fiddle, violin, fiddle? If I go over to Sherry's fiddle, and I sit on that fiddle, is it going to be very comfortable? No. Matter of fact, it'll probably hurt. All right? It's not made for that purpose. And see, God's made you for a purpose. He's, he's planned out your contribution, what he wants you to do. And I think it's incredible. And so this morning, as we go through these tests, I want you to realize that these are ways that you can recognize God's voice. And by the way, as I go through these seven things, you can't say, well, I like uh, two, three, and five. I'll just, I'll just stick with that. You have to use all seven. Or use none. All seven work together. I should point that out to you. Let me give you number five. Does it concern my responsibility? Does it fit into my responsibilities? You ever have someone come to you and say, you know what, God told me what you should be doing. And I would say, he never told me. I, 
One time I had a, in my last church, I had a, a, a guy pull up in a great big old Cadillac, pulled under the carport of the church. He came in and I heard him talk. He, I don't know if you were at the desk or someone else. He came in and said, is the pastor in? The Lord told me I'm to hold revival services here for the next two weeks. And I'm to tell him that. And uh, so I came out of my office and um, I'm a little more, I'm a lot milder now than what I used to be. Um, I came out of my office and I, and I introduced myself and was nice to him. And, um, and he says, the Lord told me to tell you I'm going to have revival services in your church for the next two weeks. And that's supposed to happen starting tonight. And I just said to him, well, I said, until I hear it from the Lord, you're not going to come anywhere near it. You're not going to have the services and, um, and so he got a little bit angry at me and left because the Lord didn't tell me, but he was certain that he could tell me what the Lord was saying for me to hear. And sometimes spouses can do that to their husbands. Well, the Lord told me you need to be doing this, you know, and the spouse said, well, no, the Lord told me you ought to be doing this. And it's amazing how sometimes we think that God speaks to us for somebody else, but that's not the way it works. Does it concern your responsibility? If it's not your responsibility, why in the world would God talk to you about it? I think that's a pretty good question. Peter, if you look in, in John chapter 21, Peter once was talking to Jesus, and Jesus told Peter exactly how he was going to die. Now that was a great conversation to have, right? And so Peter looks over at one of the other disciples, John, and he says, well, what about him? You know, if I'm going to be die hanging upside down on, you know, uh, what about him? And, and Jesus in that story basically said, well, Peter, it's none of your business what I do with him. You follow me. You worry about following me and don't worry about what I do in other people's lives. So one of the tests of whether it's God's voice that we're hearing or not is, does it concern your responsibility? And, and I think, in other words, I think Jesus in that story in John 21 was trying to tell them, you know, get your own act together. Don't go around judging other people. Don't go around worrying about what other people should be doing or not doing. When you listen to God's voice, listen so that he can speak to you. I don't know about you. I don't, I don't want to hear from somebody else. I want to hear what God has to say to me. I want to become more like him. I want to be faithful to him. I want to hear his voice. And so when God begins to speak to you, he's not going to necessarily speak to you for your husband or your spouse, your boyfriend or girlfriend, but you need to listen for yourself and let God speak into things that you're responsible for. Number six, is it convicting rather than condemning? This is a big one. This is a biggie. Matter of fact, if I was going to have a biggie, this is it. All right. I mean, number one was a biggie. It doesn't fit into the Bible, but this is a biggie as well. Is it convicting rather than condemning? And I need to explain the difference because I think a lot of Christians don't understand the difference. And they go through life under condemnation. They go through life with all kinds of guilt thinking. Well, all kinds of guilt thinking that it's the voice of God, and it's not. It's oftentimes the devil. It's Satan that is condemning them, not God convicting them. So let me talk about this. Conviction comes from God. Condemnation comes from Satan. And so the purpose of conviction is to correct something that's out of whack in your life. The purpose of condemnation is just to put you down and just to make you feel miserable and to make you feel guilty, make you feel ashamed. And see, there are a lot of people who think that Christianity is all about, you know, whipping themselves, woe is me, I'm, I'm, I'm nobody, and they, they you know, I, you know I, I failed again, and I, I, can't, I, can't, you know, I can't get up and try to live for the Lord because I'm such a failure. And see, that doesn't come from God. He doesn't condemn you. He convicts you of your sin, and he wants you to leave your sin behind. But he wants you to be free. The motivation behind conviction is that God loves you. 
God loves me, and he wants to help us to be a better person. He wants to help us to be ready for eternity. The motivation behind condemnation, and I hope you catch this, is that Satan hates your guts. He wants to make you miserable. He will speak to you and mislead you. He will miscommunicate, miscommunicate to you. He will condemn you about all things in general where conviction, God will speak to you specifically about something and says, you need to change this. Satan, on the other hand, says, you know what? You're just miserable. You're, you're a nobody. You're a, you're a you know, scum of the, in the, you know, the pond. The devil is the one who wants to make you miserable. God doesn't want to make you miserable. God will convict you. But it's Satan who is the one who comes along and says, you're hopeless, you're worthless, you're dirt, you're crud, you're unlovable. And some believers today think that's a part of the God that we serve. That isn't a part of the God that we serve. Our God is a convicting God. For those, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so this morning, I don't know how to say it any clearer than this. If you still feel guilty after you confess the sin, that guilt is not from God. It's from the devil. Because God doesn't make you feel guilty for the stuff that, he's, that you've already confessed and asked for forgiveness. He has forgiven you and says it's over. It's cast as far as the east is from the west. It's over. So when you want to know whether it's God speaking to you or whether it's Satan speaking to you, is it a conviction that you're experiencing? Are you feeling condemned? And if you're feeling condemned and you know, I'm worthless and, you know, I, and my life is over, I mean, that's not from God. And so we need to recognize that. Conviction is good. Condemnation is bad. And we need to be reminded of that. Romans 8, one is that reference. For there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. God will never attack your value. God will never devalue you. He will never put you down. He will convict you of your sin, rightly so, but he'll never put you down. Number seven. I don't know. I think my watch has stopped. Is it? Yeah, it's, I have only 11 o'clock. Is that what it is? Yeah, just kidding. Number seven, we're going to be done. Lord, we want to recognize your voice in the midst of all the noise around us. And this number seven is, do I sense God's peace about it? Do you sense God's peace? If you get an impression or an idea, or if you've got to make a decision, do you sense God's peace? Or do you feel pressured about it? If it makes you feel pressured and overwhelmed, if it makes you feel confused, then I think you should question uh, whether or not that impression or that idea is actually from God. Because God wants you to sense his peace, not to live your life under this immense pressure. And sometimes we put ourselves in a pressure cooker because we go ahead of God and we make decisions we shouldn't make. We say things we shouldn't say. And the pressure is on us not because of what God, it's because we're not listening to his voice. And therefore, we don't have that peace. God wants to give us a sense of his peace, not to live under that pressure. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, that God's not the author of confusion. In other words, if it doesn't make sense in our lives, it didn't come from the Lord. And so, for those of you who are parents, and, 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 and I know even as a grandparent now, I would love to take all the pressure off of my kids. I have adult children who are feeling the pressures of life and paying bills and how are we going to do this and taking care of kids and how are we going to pay for the diapers and, and, and the list goes on. If I could snap my fingers and take the pressure off as a dad, as a grandfather, I would love to do that. And that's the way God is. He doesn't want you to feel overwhelmed and confused and pressured. He wants you to have that peace. And as parents, you know you don't want your kids to be pressured all the time. You want them to have that peace. And that's the way God is. The only time pressure is legitimate for us as believers is when God has told us to do something specifically and we haven't done it. And God puts the pressure on a little bit and says, are you going to do it? Are you going to be obedient? 
God puts that little bit of pressure on us. But that's the only time that that pressure is legitimate. But here's what Satan does. Satan drives us to be compulsive. He drives us to make decisions quickly without considering these tests or these filters. Satan pushes us to do things where God desires to draw us compassionately. You notice the difference? Satan says, get it done, go, 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 get it done. Who cares about the pressure? Where God says, you know what? Come on, we can do this. This is what I'm speaking to you. And he's very compassionate about drawing us. See, we have a great God. He wants to help you in your family. He wants to help you in your finances. He wants to help you in your struggle with addictions. He wants to help you in your marriage. He wants to help you as you go through college. He wants to help you in your business. He wants to help you to be the, uh, the best you can in your workplace, in the marketplace. God wants you to have a peace as you go through all of that. Where Satan wants to put the pressure on, he wants you to have a lack of peace in your life. The Lord is very compassionate with us, and he draws us. And we need to be reminded of that. As I close out this message this morning, I'm very conscious of the fact that I want God to speak to us in the 21st century. He is transmitting his signals all the time. Every day, he wants to speak to you, no matter what age you are, no matter where you're at. He's transmitting. Beep, 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 beep. You know, that's my radio sound, all right? He's transmitting. He wants to come and draw near to you. But the question is, would you even recognize his voice? And I hope these seven tests this morning, and even of those listening online, these seven tests, I hope you take these and, and apply these when you say, is this what God wants me to do? Is this really God's voice, or is it Satan's voice, or is it the bad pizza the night before? We need to recognize God's voice. And folks, we can do that, because God still speaks, but we need to be able to recognize his voice. Let's stand together in closing. Mm -hmm.